I have two questions about hair pieces and the sinusitis. Please, you alluded to hair piece treatment. Could you uh, be okay. true? Sophia, no. I'm, I'm happy to answer your question, but I, I'm, I'm, you're going in and out here. Could, could you say that again? Sorry, about herpes? Herpes, herpes. okay. Herpes. Yeah, so there, yeah, so, so there are multiple herpes family viruses. And it is interesting. Um, as you know, herpes family virus. Uh-oh. This is RG6A. And so there's a lot of work showing that the dominant virus family that is associated with cognitive decline and ultimately with Alzheimer's is the herpes virus family. So we always are, are, are careful to look at titers to the different herpes family members, including EBV, CMV, HVZ, HSV1, uh, HHV6, all of those. And so, and to address those, and I mentioned earlier, the Taiwan study showed that treating outbreaks very helpful. Now, of course, some of these other family members don't respond very well to things like ballet, cyclovir, um, but again, resilience helpful and also things like transfer factor plasmic and, and in some cases, fulvic acid, humic acid, these things can all be helpful, again, as part of your armamentarium to deal with this particular family that unfortunately likes the brain. Thank you very much. And I think Sophia had an extra question. Well, the second question. Yeah. Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, about chronic sinusitis, is there yes. a natural approach, approach to treating it? Thank this you. is a great point. And again, this is a, a field unto itself. And as you probably know, Dr. Dennis, an ENT surgeon from Atlanta, um, has really made a specialty of dealing with chronic sinusitis, often associated with molds, often associated with cognitive decline. So, you know, we have some people who have these that are bacterial, some that have that are fungal. So when you're doing the evaluations, you want to uh, make sure to include, uh, you know, looking for mold species as well as just looking for Marcons. Of course, Richie Shoemaker has used the Marcons approach, especially uh, looking for biofilms. And of course, the latest in all this saga is people who have COVID-19. Uh, and of course, the same sort of thing where they're, where they're getting infections, um, they're often get developing anosmia, and of course, they are developing brain fog. And, and so we recommend anybody who has had COVID-19, especially if you've had any brain fog with it, or if you've lost your sense of smell with it, please get on active prevention because you are likely to be at increased risk. And we don't have enough data yet, but everything so far supports the idea that you are going to be at increased risk for cognitive decline in the future. So just as you would say to someone, for example, who has a history of Alzheimer's in their family, or just as you'd say to someone who has a history of head trauma, please, if you've had COVID-19, please get on active prevention. Thank you very much for that. And um, let's go now to Monty. And welcome, Monty. Thank you very much, doctor, from Ontario. So you spoke of berberine, yes. um, coffee berry, and uh, berberine, coffee berry, and um, sealant cinnamon. Can you expand on it a little more for me? And I read that there's a form of berberine called dihydroberberine. Is it any different from the normal berberine? You know, it's a good point. I have not used dihydroberberine. It's a good question. And I know, you know people have used all sorts of uh, approaches. And again, we think in terms of what is the synaptic neurochemistry we're trying to get? And that includes your systemic status with your insulin sensitivity. So we tend to use berberine in people who aren't able to get their HOMA IR and aren't able to get their hemoglobin A1C down to optimal. We'd like to see you down, you know, 5.0, 5.1, 4.9. If they're typically hanging out in the pre-diabetic range, you know, 5.7, 5.8, we'd like to get that down with diet, with exercise, with sleep, with a you know, stress reduction, all of these things. Um, you know, even things like katsu bands, it can be helpful. But for those who aren't able to do that, then we start thinking about, okay, we could add some cinnamon, for example. With the whole coffee fruit, we're thinking more in terms of increasing BDNF. This is not so much about glucose control. But of course, high fiber diets, so much you can do for glucose control. And of course, Mark Hyman has talked about this extensively. Some people like to use 
NACs. I mean, there are all sorts of things. Lipoic acid can be helpful. Getting your magnesium optimized, getting your zinc optimized, huge. Now, the one concern I have with things like metformin and berberine, and they have somewhat similar activities, they have a little bit of an uncoupling effect. And so there's a metformin study that showed long-term use was associated with increased risk for Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease. Luckily, that was only one study. But therefore, we try again, we try as with everything in functional medicine to be physiological, upstream, natural, and staying away from drugs and things like that. So I would use berberine and metformin as some of the later things but early on, there's a tremendous amount you can do to get the person to be insulin sensitive and to get them to have normal glycemia. Thanks very much, Dr. Bredesen. And up next, we have Elaine. Welcome. Yes. Hi. I was wondering if you could describe the exercise with oxygen protocol in a little yes. more detail. Is it interval training with oxygen on the exertion, et cetera? And where can we go to find those? It's a great point, and there and there are a number uh, a number of these. And you know, I don't I don't work for for these various companies. Live O2, and you know, we're always looking for what's the best outcome. I think Live O2 has done a nice job, but there are others as well. Um, and with Live O2, what they've done um, is it fits very well with what was reported a few months ago by the Israeli group that has had good results with HBOT instead. They're using a different approach. The idea is. You want to run the oxygen up first. And in this case, I like it because you're actually improving the blood flow as well, which is why I like EWOT. It's also less expensive than HBOT, which is, which is nice. So the first thing is you're running the oxygen up. So you're now taking areas that have not potentially, if not gotten the support that they need. But now you're cycling. And so what LIVO2 does is cycle you into a relative, you want to be very mild, but a relative hypoxia, which now stimulates the production of trophic support. So you're kind of getting the best of both worlds, which again was pointed out by the Israeli group. They do the same thing. They do these five minute uh, hypoxic cycles and then back into hyperoxia again. So uh, that I think, especially for people where blood flow is an issue, where vascular component is an issue, where oxygenation is an issue can be very, very helpful. And I would add for people with histories of trauma as well. So that's why I like EWOT. Now, you know, it is, even though it's less expensive than HBOT, it is somewhat expensive. And if you're gonna buy your own equipment, you know, it's several thousand dollars, but you can go, there are a number of gyms, there are a number of doctor's offices that have this as well. So I think, again, in the overall armamentarium, especially for those subtypes, it can be very helpful. Mm -hmm.